Before starting, please subscribe. I am very close to 900 subs, so please help me achieve it. On a vibrant morning, a 30-year-old Brazilian, a huge fan of One Piece, walked to work. Holding his phone, he was engrossed in the latest chapter of the manga, so engrossed that he didn't notice the speeding truck approaching as he crossed the street. All he heard was a noise and a feeling of disarray. As if things were out of place. He felt nothing and was thankful for it. What felt like months passed by, but he wasn't sure. Until one moment, a bright light could be seen. Before him stood a majestic, almost divine figure. You are a lucky man, to think I've stumbled upon a wandering soul. As our paths intertwined, I'll offer you a chance, a fresh start in a different universe. The man became excited, recalling all the Ice Guy stories he knew. Choose your universe, any you'd like. I will also grant you three wishes. In return, I'll take some of your memories as a form of exchange. He knew what he wanted, I wish to go to the world of One Piece, specifically to Logue Town, during the last day of Gold Roger. And my wishes are, to have the appearance and abilities of young Satoru Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen. To absorb the knowledge of the wisest in all anime. A tailor made Akuma no Mi. The entity, reflecting, stated there would be alterations. Regarding knowledge, it would be too much for his mind. He would have to limit himself to a single universe. He felt momentarily disappointed, but soon cheered up and chose Dragon Ball, recalling its connection with One Piece. As for the Akuma no Mi, he asked for something to write with to describe the fruit he wished for, a paramecia that allows transforming inanimate objects into human versions of fictional characters from 2D universes. They can toggle between forms, and the user creates bonds with these beings. Abilities 1. Transform inanimate objects into human versions of fictional characters. 2. The sentient being, transformed into human form, can revert to its original state and toggle between the two, retaining its intelligence and capabilities. 3. Create soul connections between the user and the transformed objects. Abilities 1. The new living being acquires all the physical traits, strength, agility, dexterity, etc., of the fictional character. 2. Physical techniques similar to those of the fictional characters. 3. Gradual obedience of the transformed objects to the user. The entity agreed but placed limitations on the Akuma no Mi. Limitations 1. Transformation requires a soul sacrifice. 2. Obedience from the objects is not instantaneous. 3. The user can't confer mystical abilities from the character's universe. Reading the alterations, the man sighed in disappointment but understood the necessity. And thus, at the top of the paper appeared the fruit's name, Henshin Henshin no Mi. Accepting the terms, the man readied himself. With a gesture, the deity began his adventure in one piece. The morning was bustling in Logue Town, the city of execution. The sun cast its first golden rays upon the streets, revealing a crowd that seemed endless. Around the corners, whispers mingled with the noise of sailors' boots hurrying by blending in with shouts and commands. The central square, the place of execution, was a storm of emotions. Sailors in their pristine uniforms, led by high-ranking guards, unsuccessfully tried to maintain order. Among the crowd, keen eyes stood out. Some were merely curious onlookers, while others had darker intentions. In the midst of it all, a teenager with white hair and dark glasses watched everything with a deep, serious gaze his thoughts drifting between the past and the present. He is the man who reincarnated and became Satoru Gojo. He overheard snippets of conversations, rumors about characters who would, in the future, hold immense importance in the pirate world. Do you think the rumors are true? That Dracul Myhawk is here? Asked a young, eager pirate to his companion, an older man with visible battle scars. The older man replied with an ironic laugh, why would Myhawk care about this? But what truly captured Satoru's attention was a conversation happening beside him, did you see? It seems even Whitebeard sent representatives to witness this. Gold Roger truly marked his era. The atmosphere was a whirlwind of actions and reactions. 
sailors escorted unruly pirates away, while the spectators cast looks of sympathy, hatred, or indifference to the place where Gold Roger would meet his fate. A sense of finality, a page turning in the history of the seas, was about to be written. Amid the commotion, as the noise of the crowd reached its peak, an iconic figure was brought forth, Gold. D. Roger. The square was pulsating with emotion and anticipation. I, still trying to absorb the reality of having reincarnated in the One Piece universe looking like Satoru Gojo, was there, immersed in one of the most iconic scenes of the anime. The atmosphere was so tangible that I could feel the air condensing, laden with anxiety. Roger, the legendary pirate king, moved with a strangely triumphant grace towards the stage of his execution. What can I say? For a moment, I felt out of place, a silent and distant spectator in a fictional world that suddenly became my reality. The anime's details did not do justice to the true grandeur of the scene before me. Every step, every murmur from the crowd, every ray of sunlight that pierced the thick clouds in the sky, everything seemed surreal. I observed the clouds, it was clear. Truly a memorable day. I smiled up at the sky. Amidst the commotion, people around me were commenting amongst themselves, with voices trembling from shock or excitement. I can't believe I'm seeing this live, said a woman next to me. Does the treasure really exist? murmured an old sailor with dreamy eyes, holding a worn-out map. Looking around more, I was startled. This is insane. I thought, recognizing the faces of Shanks, Buggy, and Myhawk. I heard Doflamingo is here now, someone whispered behind me. I tried to find Doflamingo, one of my favorite characters, in the crowd, but I couldn't. Still, the scene before me was such a vivid reminder of the anime that I felt a chill run down my spine. I looked back at the stage. Gold Roger, with his characteristic smile that mixed mockery and courage, was interrupted by the guard reading the list of his numerous crimes. That's the true power of a pirate king. Even in the face of death, he remains unshaken. A man beside me exclaimed. The pause was broken by the guard who gave Roger a chance to say his last words. With a cheeky smile, Roger made his unusual request to scratch an itch, drawing laughter from some in the crowd, including myself. But what came next changed everything. Hey! Pirate King! Where is your treasure? The One Piece! The voice of a stranger echoed, cutting through the crowd's murmur like a sharp knife. The question about One Piece drew everyone's attention, and Roger's eyes twinkled with amusement. My treasure? If you want it, go and get it, I left it all in that place. His announcement about the hidden treasure in the Grand Line triggered chaos. In a frantic attempt to silence him, the guards stabbed him with spears, but the revelation had already been made. The square became pandemonium, with people shouting and running in all directions. Hearing the uproar, a boy exclaimed, I'm going to become the Pirate King. Amid the chaos, I found myself thinking, well, I guess it's time to start my own adventure in this crazy world. One piece awaits. Amidst the turmoil of Logue Town, as the last rays of sun hid away, I found myself in an alleyway. My stomach began to grumble, and there was nothing good to eat. The distant voices of sailors, muffled screams, and the sound of the waves reminded me of the chaos that had settled in the city after the execution of Gold Roger. The new pirates were already at sea with their stolen merchant ships. It was utter chaos. Several vice-admirals had appeared to quell the chaos and organize the troops. The trading points were all closed. Some had been raided by new pirates, seeking resources for their venture. There were already reports of invasions on islands that had been peaceful until then. Surely, the newspaper would be full of information tomorrow. Trying to stay out of the active sights of the streets, I opened the backpack given by that mysterious entity and stared at the Akuma no Mi. With a resigned sigh, I took a bite of the fruit and immediately felt my face twist. How disgusting! It was like biting into the worst of rotten fruits but I knew that was the price to pay for unparalleled power. Now, it was time to check the knowledge I acquired from the Dragon Ball universe. I closed my eyes and focused on my thoughts, trying to probe the limits of my mind. 
the atmosphere around me became eerily calm. And there I found those compartments, like rooms in a vast library. Each room bore the name of some scientist or inventor from the Dragon Ball universe. It was as if each one contained the accumulated knowledge of these geniuses. Dr. Briefs, Bulma, Jero. The list was extensive. As I approached the room named Bulma, I could visualize glass jars containing liquids of various colors and viscosities, with labels reading things like robotics and mechanics. It was a repository of knowledge at my disposal. This is going to be amazing, I murmured, a smile beginning to form on my lips. As pessimistic as my nature was, I couldn't suppress the excitement. Maybe this world wasn't so bad after all. Suddenly, a noise from the back of the alley brought me back to reality. A gruff voice sounded, Hey, you. What are you doing there? It was a sailor, recognizable, by his white uniform. He looked at me suspiciously. Just resting, I replied dryly, setting my backpack aside and standing up. Any problem? The sailor too. What a shame. I still have no idea how to use the six eyes, I sighed, having successfully escaped from the sailor. Looking around, I searched for something to utilize with my ability. Something special. An object with meaning. Then I remembered. What a fool, I thought to myself. It was right in front of my eyes, literally. I took off the blue glasses and held them in front of me. He paused for a moment and sighed. There were still some doubts, but I needed to act before being interrupted again. Darkness was settling in, and all the town's inhabitants took shelter. Anyone on the streets would undoubtedly be a potential suspect. I visualized the transformation I desired, and with a gesture, I let the energy flow. Suddenly, a white light emanated from my palm and was absorbed by the glasses. Exhaustion struck every fiber of my being, nearly making me pass out. The glasses, previously blue, now had a ruby hue. They trembled in my hand, leapt, and a bright and dazzling light shone. And in the blink of an eye, in front of me stood a familiar figure, I saw a woman in a bold red kimono, looking at me with curiosity. The kimono had a deep neckline revealing her ample bust. It was shorter than a traditional kimono, exposing much of her thighs. A white belt was tied around her waist. She had long, black hair, tied with a white ribbon. And in her hands, she held a fan. For a moment, everything went silent. The gentle night breeze softly rustled the kimono, as she observed me with a curious gaze. My Sharanui. Can you help me find lodging? I need a place to rest and eat, Satoru said quickly. She looked at him with a puzzled expression. Are you speaking to me? He hesitated, realizing this wasn't the same my he knew from the anime. Of course, I'm your master. He tried to instill this idea in her mind, hoping the brainwashing would work. My seemed to process his words for a moment, then her eyes widened as she stared at Satoru's face, her cheeks tinting pink. Before he could say more, she vanished in a flash, leaving Satoru agape. That, speed, insane. Within seconds, he heard noise from a nearby shop and saw the door open, revealing Mai with a bright smile. I found a place. Walking into the store, he quickly scanned the items, his stomach growling with hunger. Mai confirmed the place was empty, and he headed to the kitchen, devouring any food he found. She watched him with curiosity, and they shared a light-hearted moment, laughing together. I'm going to lie down, he said, drained. I'll come with you, she replied with a sly smile. He hesitated, considering all the potential complications. Let's sleep in separate beds. He'd be lying if he said he wasn't expecting this at some point. But it still felt a bit too early, given his fatigue. Not to mention her reaction is entirely unpredictable, what if she tried to kill him? After all, she wasn't fully bound as his servant. She nodded, slightly disappointed but understanding. Laying down, he began to reflect on his former life, what little he still remembered. He recalled the ups and downs, his frustrations and joys. He remembered losing himself in fictional worlds, seeking solace in stories. And now, he was living one. 
suddenly, he fell asleep. At the break of day, the pale glow of dawn filtered through the wooden window cracks. Satoru, still groggy, felt the light touch his face. He rubbed his eyes slowly and opened them, noticing the soft warmth filling the room. Standing and stretching, he saw Mai already standing by the bed, her loose kimono revealing more skin than he expected to see so early. Good morning, she said with a smile that could light up the sky. Good morning, he replied, his voice raspy and quickly averting his eyes. He got up, trying to occupy his mind with other thoughts. The house had been looted recently, and the two needed to check what was left. He wanted to avoid any trouble, and Mai's provocative attire could attract unwanted attention. He got up and decided to take another look at the household items. The town was starting to awaken. Market stalls being set up, sailors getting ready to set sail, and the smell of the sea mingled with the sweet aroma of food. Satoru smiled, relieved to still find some valuable items in the looted shop. We'll sell the items and buy some supplies before we leave. Mai nodded. He knew he had to leave Logue Town, the execution of gold. Roger and his last words started a bloodbath in the coming years. And it all began yesterday, after his execution. For this reason, he aims to go to the safest place in the sea, Fusha Village. Mai nodded. He checked the bags of valuable items one more time before leaving. Mai walked beside him, still a bit upset for being asked to change clothes. He sighed. He had asked Mai to change her clothes, but she overreacted. He likes to look, but at the moment it causes more trouble than benefits. They stopped at various shops and stalls, exchanging items for coins. The merchants are sharp, they notice these might be stolen items. They show hesitation at first, but the prospect of profit overcomes their doubts. After dealing with several merchants, Satoru accumulates a fair amount of money, 50,000 berries. The next step is to find a boat, but I'm not sure how to get one. I think we might have to steal one. Mai, seeing Satoru's hesitation, leans in and whispers, leave it to me. She waves and disappears into the busy streets. Satoru watches Mai vanish, marveling at her speed. Suddenly, he was interrupted by a tap on the shoulder. Looking up, he saw a rough-looking sailor with an anchor tattoo on his arm, looking at him with a sardonic smile. You knew around here? the sailor asked. With a cold stare, Satoru retorted, Why do you ask? The sailor looked intently, You and your friend drew a lot of attention today. Some merchants reported suspicious objects being sold by you. I'm merely conducting an inspection. I knew I shouldn't have drawn so much attention, I sighed. I glanced to the corner of the street and saw several other sailors watching, waiting for an order from their leader. Who might you be? Satoru inquired. I am the commander of this area, Lieutenant Junior Grade Kazuki. I was about to reply to Lieutenant Kazuki when I felt a surge of movement in the streets. My speed made her almost a blur to most. I could see her clearly. She was returning. Kazuki took a step forward, his eyes locked onto mine. You are not permitted to leave before the inspection is complete, he stated with an authoritative tone. His words were clear and threatening. Do you really think you can stop me, Lieutenant Kazuki? I let a sardonic smile cross my face. We were just leaving. Kazuki raised a hand and instantly the surrounding sailors advanced. They came at me, armed and ready to strike. I saw every move they made, anticipating their attacks. A sailor swung his sword at me. I dodged and, reflexively, touched him, causing a liquid, translucent, white soul, to exit his body. He collapsed, and I stared at the orb in my hand, dumbfounded. Mommy, look, he absorbed the white thing from that man. What is it? A young boy remarked as his mother tried to pull him back inside their house. I didn't have time to ponder what just happened. Beside me, Mai was delivering martial arts blows to other sailors. Her hands and feet were like sharp blades, cutting through the air as she took down one adversary after another. That woman. I've never seen anyone move so fast. An older sailor exclaimed, alarmed. 
Satoru, let's go, she yelled, her eyes determined. Kazuki dashed towards me, his face twisted with anger. He threw a heavy punch, but I sidestepped and returned the favor, with a solid punch, to his face. The impact sent him reeling backward, and he landed with a thud on the ground. My, now! I shouted. With the sailors disoriented and Kazuki momentarily incapacitated, we sprinted through the bustling streets of Logue Town. A young sailor, who had been knocked down by Mai, watched the escape, trembling slightly. Those two. They're not ordinary. Lieutenant Kazuki should have been more cautious. At the Logue Town Marine Base, the Marine Base was stifling under the midday sun's heat. The tension in the air was palpable, with sailors swiftly moving to and fro, some exchanging words in hushed tones, others appearing worried and alarmed. At the center of the chaos stood the Marine Lieutenant Officer, Kumori. He bore a commanding presence, deeply engrossed in thought, his brow furrowed and eyes staring blankly ahead. His hands, firm and calloused, rested on the table, before him, fingers lightly drumming on the wooden surface. A sailor approached with a slightly hesitant demeanor. He looked young and anxious, his breathing rapid. Sir, he began, his voice slightly shaky, Petty Officer Kazuki was attacked. He, he was taken down by a stranger peddling suspicious wares around the town. Kumori looked up, clear surprise on his face. His expression quickly hardened, the gaze turning icier. Give me more details. The sailor swallowed hard, visibly intimidated. He was with a woman, sir. They assaulted several of our men and then fled. It seems the stranger possesses strange abilities. Kumori raised an eyebrow, intrigued. Strange how? He touched one of the sailors, and something came out of him, sir. The sailor died shortly after. For a moment, silence took over the post. Kumori's eyes narrowed. A devil fruit? I want those two located. Order an immediate pursuit and request a depiction of the assailant for a bounty poster. Furthermore, the dock should be cordoned off. His voice was firm, leaving no room for dispute. Yes, sir, the sailor responded, turning to carry out the orders. At that moment, another sailor, looking anxious, approached swiftly. Sir, we have news of the Black Harpoon Pirates. R. Kumori cut him off with a stern look. I know who they are. Just do as I said. With a formal nod, the sailor departed, leaving Kumori lost in his thoughts. Concern was evident on his face. He knew the coming days in Logetown would be anything but peaceful. Logetown, Dock. The sun lights up the sea water, creating shimmering reflections on the surface. The docks buzz with the noise of water splashing, conversations between fishermen, shouts from sellers announcing their fresh fish, laughter of children chasing each other, and the sound of waves breaking on the piers. A cool breeze blows, carrying the salty smell of the sea, mixed with the scent of fresh fish. Despite the beautiful day, there is a palpable tension in the air. Exchanged glances among those present are cautious, and conversations are whispered as if they feared being overheard. Fisherman Masato and his friends, Hiroshi and Yumi, are tying their nets and pulling the fresh fish from the boat. Masato is a robust middle-aged man with wrinkles from many days in the sun and calloused hands. He has a worried look as he talks to his friends. Masato, holding the newspaper, stares intently at the headline about the new pirate attacks. He flips the page to show his friends, all with wide eyes and heavy expressions. Masato, these pirates are getting bolder. I heard they spare no one. Hiroshi, rubbing his sparse beard, maybe it's time for us to move. My wife has been talking about it for a long time. Yumi, looking out to the sea with determination, hey. We can't always run. We need to protect what's ours. Hiroshi rolls his eyes, protect, against those monsters? You're crazy. Masato sighs, pointing to the distant sea, if they come, what will we do? Logetown, market. The market is bustling with colors and sounds, with vendors announcing their deals in loud voices, children running and playing between the stalls, and the chirping of birds. 
Sayuri, with a basket on her arm, picks vegetables, while her son plays with a nearby dog. She is a middle-aged woman, modestly dressed, with dark hair, tied up in a bun. Concerned about rumors, she tries to buy supplies as quickly as possible. We should buy more rice and beans. If the pirates come. Sayuri's sister, Yuki, interrupts, don't speak like that in front of Kenzo. He's scared enough already. Kenzo, the boy, raises his fist, I'm not scared, mom. I'll fight them. Sayuri, embracing her son, I just want to make sure we're prepared, no matter what happens. Sayuri's sister places a hand on her shoulder, trying to reassure her, while the boy looks determined. Logetown, Shipyard The shipyard is full of workers repairing boats and ships. Carpenter Korwa and his co-workers, Satoshi and Hiro, are discussing in hushed voices. Korwa, wiping sweat from his brow, if they come, the shipyard will be one of the first places to be attacked. We need to be ready. Satoshi, looking at the tools, how? By setting up barricades? Hiro, pointing at the boats, maybe we can prepare some boats for a quick escape if the worst happens. Korwa nods. We must be prepared for the worst. Logetown, Watchtower. A tall structure with a wide view of the sea horizon. Guardian Toshi, a slender young man with messy hair and sharp eyes, adjusting a telescope. Toshi adjusts the focus of the telescope, scanning the vast ocean for abnormalities. His hand shakes slightly, a tiny black dot, almost imperceptible, catches his attention. He turns the telescope to zoom in on that distant spot. The ship's lines become clearer, revealing tall masts and black sails. His heart races, and his breathing becomes irregular. It can't be. Not now. As minutes pass, the ship grows in size and threat. The pirate flag, a skull with a harpoon and crossed bones, is clearly visible, waving in the wind. Pirate ship sighted. Everyone get ready. Toshi shouts in despair. He drops the telescope, tripping over his own feet as he runs down the tower's spiral stairs. Reaching the ground, Toshi, panting, runs towards the town square, trying to warn as many people as possible. His face, once pale with fear, is now red from exertion and the burning sun. They're coming. The pirates are coming. Townspeople stop in the middle of their daily tasks, looking at him with wide-eyed terror. Mothers grab their children, vendors start packing up their goods, and the once noisy and lively town falls into a frenzy of panic. An old fisherman grabs Toshi by the arm, his eyes piercing him. Are you sure, boy? Toshi, with tears forming, I saw it with my own eyes. The Black Harpoon Flag In the vast blue ocean of the East Blue, near the dock of Logetown, a large ship with a black flag bearing a harpoon design was quickly approaching. The sun shone brightly, reflecting on the calm waters, but despite the sunny weather, tension filled the air. Shouts and orders could be heard as the ship drew closer to the dock. Standing on the deck was Kenji, known as the Thorn, captain of the Black Harpoon Pirates. His stern and piercing gaze swept the horizon, his long black hair billowing in the wind. Around him, his crew readied themselves for the impending raid, bustling in anticipation. Tied and gagged at the ship's bow, a group of hostages shivered in fear, their eyes pleading. His second-in-command, Riku, approached. Riku, Captain, the town must be on alert. Shall we proceed? Kenji, smiling maliciously, yes. Logetown will be ours. Kenji's ambition shone in his eyes. He craved power and wealth, and Logetown was the next target on his list. His subordinates shared the same ambition, ready to follow every order of their captain without hesitation. As they neared, Logetown's defenses became apparent. Sailors in position, cannons aimed, and the populace in panic. The challenge was set. Prepare to board. Kenji roared, his voice echoing throughout the ship. Use the hostages as shields. And start loading the cannons. The hostages sobbed, their voices muffled by the rags in their mouths, as they were dragged forward by the pirates. 
Kenji, keeping his gaze fixed on the town, said, If any sailor dares to shoot, throw them overboard. I want no survivors. One of the hostages, a young woman, managed to break free and tried to run. A pirate swiftly grabbed her by the arm and dragged her back, threatening her with a blade. The ship managed to dock, and the pirates, with hostages in front, began their invasion. Kenji watched the scene, pleased with his crew's efficiency. He knew this was just another step in his conquest. Logetown was in chaos, screams, fire, and fights spread through the streets. Kenji advanced through the streets. Hey! H.M.? A shout caught his attention. Turning around, on a rooftop of a house, he saw a man with unusual eyes, accompanied by a voluptuous woman dressed in red. Above the chaos, on a rooftop, two figures stood out, a man with light blue eyes, shielded by a band, and silver hair tied back, and a woman in red attire, her fans at the ready, a determined look in her brown eyes. Below them, the streets teemed with over 150 subordinate black harpoon pirates, spreading chaos. Satoru gazed down at the city, his eyes narrowing beneath the band. He didn't see himself as a hero. 1. He sought adventure, but. The town was under siege. The pirates' mission was clear, to capture Logue Town with their vast number. He sighed. My, he murmured, it's time to act. She nodded, and together, they leapt off the roof, plunging directly into the chaos. With speed and agility, he dodged attacks, blocked strikes with his bare hands, and with every touch on a pirate, a white light emerged from the target, being absorbed. My, wielding her fans, slashed and struck, her movements as fluid as water, but as deadly as fire. A sword-wielding pirate approached, initiating a sword strike. Satoru dodged and touched the blade, and in the blink of an eye, the metal transformed into a goblin from the series Goblin Slayer. The monster, now freed from its inanimate form, roared. The pirate's eyes widened in terror. What was that? One of them shouted, pointing at the creature now joining the fight. Satoru acted swiftly, moving towards the pirates, dodging and touching blades, firearms, and other weapons. Captain Kenji's men retreated, staring in horror as the swords and weapons of their comrades turned into goblins, one after the other. Satoru observed the chaos he had created, feeling a mix of thrilling emotions. With the goblins now siding with Logetown's marines, the mayhem among the pirates intensified. They were attacked from all sides. Many of them, seeing the tide turning against them, began to retreat. Who are you? growled Kenji clearly annoyed at the interruption of his invasion plans. Captain Kenji began to transform, thanks to the power of the zoan-type devil fruit, model bear. I will show you the terror of the black harpoon. Kenji roared, grinning to reveal sharp teeth. With a swift motion, he tried to hit Satoru. Satoru barely dodged in time, feeling the wind of the swipe pass close to his face. Kenji roared and, with a swing of his massive claws, lunged forward. In an almost instantaneous reflex, Satoru evaded a fatal blow. You think you can defeat me with just that? Kenji bellowed, his growl echoing throughout the square. Satoru tried to reach out and touch him, but upon contact, nothing happened. Seizing the moment of surprise, Kenji landed an elbow strike on Satoru. The blow sent him flying meters away. Without hesitation, Kenji moved to deliver the final blow. But before he could get there, Mai intervened, landing a powerful spinning kick that took Kenji by surprise. You won't lay a finger on him. The impact made the captain stagger back several steps. Kenji growled, shook his head, and with a swift motion, sent Mai flying with a slap. He then turned to Satoru, who was slowly rising. Pathetic. The two of you are no match for me. Kenji laughed, his gaze now even wilder. As he brought his blade down on Satoru, the young man was no longer there. Kenji looked around, confused, then up to the sky. Above, hovering a few meters away, was Satoru. He looked down, his blue eyes shining intensely. Suddenly, a force repelled Kenji with tremendous power, causing an explosion of dust and debris. The entire town shook from the impact. 
As the dust began to settle, Kenji, still in bare form, emerged from the rubble with wounds and torn clothes, but still standing. He roared in fury, displaying his menacing fangs. Mai stood up, brushing hair from her face. She sprinted to Satoru's side. Nearby, sailors watched the fight in astonishment. Navy Captain Kaido had just arrived and ordered his men to get ready, realizing the fight wasn't in the town's favor. That man. Kaido murmured to himself, referring to Satoru, is trouble. Knowing of Satoru's abilities, he remembered the previous incident report, causing a headache. He would have to report this to his superiors. The conscious, black harpoon pirates also stared in shock. The terror their captain could inflict was vast, but the white-haired stranger seemed to be a worthy opponent. Satoru, with a confident expression and a sarcastic smile, raised his hand toward Kenji. Thank you for helping me understand my abilities a bit more. But now, playtime's over. The daylight, somewhat dimmed by the clouds that shrouded Logetown, faintly illuminated Satoru. He firmly planted his foot on the face of the captain of the Black Harpoon Pirates, Kenji, asserting his dominance. Around, bystanders and pirates watched the scene in disbelief. From a distance, a man in a pristine white uniform observed with a piercing gaze. It was Navy Captain Kaido, impeccable in his naval attire with gleaming metals and navy blue hair slicked back. Satoru felt a sudden urgency. He needed to leave the island. He glanced toward the horizon, spotting the masts of the anchored ships. He had an epiphany. His goal, seize the ship of the Black Harpoon Pirates and set sail. The abrupt blaring of trumpets interrupted his thoughts. Armed sailors surrounded the area, and Satoru realized the situation had escalated. Time to retreat, he thought. Turning to the closest sailors, he shouted mockingly, Always late to the party, aren't you? Mai, sensing the tension, readied herself for battle beside him. He then turned to the goblins, and Mai, to the ship. Quickly. Running, fighting, and fighting our way towards the docks, the goblins were taken down one by one by the sailors' gunshots. Satoru's heart clenched at the sight of the slaughter. The efficacy of his Akuma no Mi seemed limited compared to Big Mom's power, capable of imbuing objects with intact emotions. Yet, Satoru didn't let despair get to him. His mind was set on escape. Even seeing his goblins fall, he kept running, ignoring the screams and the chaos. Out of nowhere, an attack descended upon Satoru. Navy Captain Kaido, with his flaming sword, charged at him. Narrowly, Satoru dodged, feeling the blade's heat as it whooshed by. A grin formed on his lips. This is fun, he exclaimed, reveling in the moment's adrenaline. Captain Kaido, eyes blazing with anger, shouted, Do you think you can escape the Navy's justice, pirate? Satoru, with a defiant smile, retorted, Justice? Since when does the Navy know what that is? Captain Kaido raised his hand and a rain of daggers hurtled towards Satoru and Mai. Mai swiftly pulled Satoru aside, dodging the daggers that embedded in the ground. Mai threw a smoke bomb on the ground. A dense mist filled the air in seconds, blinding everyone's view. Let's go, she yelled, pulling Satoru by the hand. Using the smoke as cover, the duo swiftly moved through the streets toward the Black Harpoon Pirate's ship. Satoru cast one last look at the scene of their confrontation, knowing that this battle with the Navy was only the beginning of many more to come on his journey. Marine Headquarters, Meeting Room The hallway buzzed with activity, with Garp and Akiji taking center stage. Akiji, in his laid-back manner, struck up a conversation. Yo, Garp-san. Capturing over 500 pirates in one day? That's impressive. Akiji remarked with a lazy grin. Garp laughed heartily, ha ha ha, just another day, they're all small fry. Before they could proceed, a formidable figure stormed in, incensed. It was Sengoku, face flushed with irritation, eyes sparking. Sengoku exclaimed, Garp. How dare you skip a meeting summoned by Kong San? Who do you think you are? Garp, with a finger nonchalantly up his nose, shrugged. Ah, Sengoku. I just wasn't in the mood today. 
knew you'd handle it. Sengoku's face turned even redder, almost purple, at Garp's dismissive response. Garp, your constant insubordination is intolerable, you can't just do as you please and expect others to clean up your mess. As the face-off between Garp and Sengoku still hung in the air, brand new, his face stern and resolute, stepped up in front of the assembled officers and began his report. Brand new started, gentlemen, adjusting his glasses and unfurling a scroll laden with images and figures, we have disturbing reports about emerging pirates. He pointed to the first image, depicting a man with piercing eyes and a long black sword. Dracul Myhawk, considered by many as the current best swordsman of the Grand Line, he's been leaving a trail of destruction in his wake, challenging the Marine's top swordsman. A concerned murmur filled the room. Some officers exchanged worried glances, while others raised their eyebrows in recognition. Next, Brand New unveiled a shadowy image of a man engulfed by shadows. Moria, gentlemen. With his ability to control shadows, he's causing havoc with corpses and other nefarious uses. Sengoku furrowed his brow, worry evident in his eyes. Beside him, Akiji maintained a stoic expression, though his gaze acknowledged the threat. The atmosphere grew heavier with every word, but the next picture brought an almost tangible silence to the room that of Don Quixote da Flamingo. Brand new continued, then we have da Flamingo. His sadism is well known. Reports of entire villages subjected to his cruel whims, people forced to fight to the death for his mere amusement, and worst of all, tales of him playing with people, manipulating them against their loved ones. At this, Sengoku's gaze darkened, a shadow passing his eyes as he recalled Rosinanti and his mission as a member of S.W.O.R.D. Akiji, despite his usual nonchalance, intently observed each image. Brand new added, and there's more, gentlemen. He quickly proceeded, lastly, Logue Town, the day after Gold D. Rogers' execution. A concerning and potentially problematic presence has been detected. We're still assessing the situation. Commodore Kizaru, watching the exchange, murmured, The seas are becoming ever more unpredictable, aren't they, Sengoku? Sengoku instructed, brand new, keep me updated on this Logetown situation. We can't afford to overlook any threat. Brand new affirmed, yes, Admiral. Alyabarna Palace, Alabasta. The grand hall of the palace brimmed with tension. Maps and plans lay strewn over a large table at the center. King Cobra, with his noble posture and dark hair, stood at its heart, receiving reports from his trusted commanders, Shaka and Pell. Shaka, your majesty, pirate attacks have risen exponentially. It seems Gold D. Rogers' execution has ignited a new wave of piracy. King Cobra ran a hand over his face, clearly concerned. I feared as much. Roger and his death have become a symbol for many. He looked out the window, viewing Alabasta's desert landscape. Our people already face many challenges with the weather and water shortage. We don't need more troubles. At that moment, the gentle, reassuring voice of his wife echoed in the hall, Cobra. All turned to behold the Queen of Alabasta, a beautiful woman with blue hair and compassionate eyes. Guards immediately straightened up, pounding their chests in salute. Some exchanged admiring and respectful glances, while others cast their eyes down in deference. She gracefully approached him, her hands gently cradling her clearly pregnant belly. Queen, we might not control events beyond our borders, but we can protect our people and land. And we'll do it together. King Cobra, deeply moved, replied, I just worry about you and our daughter. She smiled gently, playfully reprimanding him with a twinkle in her eye, you always forget, Cobra. I might be a queen, but I'm not so fragile. The king chuckled softly, touched by her affection. I would never underestimate the strongest woman in Alabasta. Drawing closer, he gently placed a hand on her belly, feeling the subtle movement of their future child. The queen giggled softly, the two sharing a moment of pure joy and love. The queen, looking deeply into his eyes, murmured, We'll overcome this. For our people. For our daughter. 
and amidst the chaos and concern, they shared a kiss, a symbol of hope and determination, for Alabasta's future. Amazon Lily, Kuja Village The village air was saturated with the energy of the Kuja warriors, training and conversing among themselves. At the village's heart, a group of young girls gathered, a freshly arrived newspaper in the hands of the tallest, a young Boa Hancock. Though she hadn't yet reached the fullness of her beauty and power, the determination in her eyes was already apparent. Look at this. Gold D. Roger, the pirate king, has been executed. Boa Hancock exclaimed, excitedly. The age of pirates truly is beginning. Boa Marigold murmured, rereading the events. Does this mean more challenges and dangers for us? Boa Sandersonia said, somewhat tense. I don't know. But it just shows we need to become stronger. We can't depend on anyone but ourselves. Hancock declared with her noted leadership spirit, facing her sisters. We have to prepare for what's to come. Marigold chimed in, animatedly. Hancock nodded with resolve. Then let's train. Every day, until our bodies can take no more. The sisters exchanged glances, and their admiration for Hancock was evident. Her influence and willpower were infectious. Even young, the three sisters were already showing the grit and determination that would, in the future, make them legendary figures in the history of the seas. Water 7, Tom's Company In the design room, Icebug and Frankie stood side by side, examining a new ship blueprint. The atmosphere was somewhat chaotic, with papers and sketches scattered everywhere. Their facial expressions clearly marked a clash of opinions. Frankie, look, Ice. This design is a revolution in naval technology. It's super. Icebug, raising an eyebrow, responded, Frankie, this is a genuinely unique idea. But, honestly, ships are for water, not roads. Frankie scoffed, ah, the great Icebug can't think a bit outside the box. What a surprise. Icebug, feeling exasperated, replied, it's not about thinking outside the box. It's about having some sense of logic and practicality. They gesticulated dramatically, each countering the other with fervent arguments. Away from them, inside a house, sitting at a sturdy wooden table, was Tom San, the legendary carpenter and fishman who once built the Oro Jackson, the ship of the Pirate King. He held a newspaper, its headlines highlighting the recent execution of Gold D. Roger. With a distant look, a mix of sadness and pride, Tom reminisced about the times he spent with Roger and his crew and all the moments they shared together. Slowly, he grabbed a bottle of rum and an empty glass. He poured the golden liquid to the brim, then raised the glass towards the window, looking at the horizon where sea met sky. To the man who sailed all seas, Gold D. Roger. Doom. Ha 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 ha. Thompson then took a sip, savoring the rum and reminiscing about the good old days. Outside, Frankie and Iceberg remained engrossed in their unending debate. The sea swelled beneath the powerful ship, reflecting the sun's rays that shimmered upon the waters. The sails were taut, rustling from the marine breeze, guiding the ship through the waves. The goblins tirelessly adjusted the ropes and coordinated the ship's course, each movement calculated and precise. Satoru Gojo lay on a beach chair. Suddenly, he lifted his blindfold for a brief moment, allowing his blue eyes with a starry pattern to gaze upon the distant horizon. An emotion of anticipation was evident in his expression. Beside him, my Shiranui was also lounging on a beach chair. She flipped her fan, quickly fanning her face, an eyebrow raised in amusement watching the goblins. My laughed, I just hope they don't decide to rebel. I wouldn't want to have to use my fans against them. Satoru found the thought amusing. He was certain this wouldn't happen. The goblins were too dim-witted. Satoru recalled the moment they boarded the ship. There were still many pirates, waiting aboard in hopes of their captain's return. Satoru drained their life energies, transforming the ship's tools into goblins. He believes he understood how the process of sucking out the souls of others worked having experienced it in his last fight. However, he was keen on mastering it even further. 
he remembered that Big Mom's Akuma no Mi wasn't originally as formidable. But after awakening, it was unparalleled. Currently, he couldn't decide the type of creature that would emerge when harnessing another person's soul as life energy. The creature would be a reflection of the extracted soul. And if the individual didn't fear him sufficiently, he would struggle to drain their energy. In this aspect, it greatly resembled Big Mom. As Satoru pondered, one of the goblins approached, bowing in a form of salute. With a nod, it conveyed a message, to which he responded. His eyes gleaming with excitement, we're nearing our destination, my. Fusha village is in sight, the sunlight gleamed on the water, bathing the residents of Fusha village. Children played gleefully, while merchants shouted offers enticing customers to their stalls. The laughter of people filled the air until. Look at that, yelled a fisherman, pointing into the distance. A ship is approaching. People's eyes followed his direction, spotting a majestic vessel with a skull and crossbones flag. The unmistakable sign of a pirate ship. Good heavens! A pirate ship, a woman exclaimed, clutching her child and pulling him away from the shore. As the ship drew closer, an uneasy murmur spread amongst the crowd. However, as it docked, a man with silvery hair and eyes hidden by a bandana calmly disembarked. By his side, a woman in red attire, with brown hair, tied in a ponytail, my Shiranui, firmly held her fans. Together, they raised their hands in a gesture of peace. Do not fear. I'm a bounty hunter, he declared, his voice confident and sturdy. The crowd eyed him warily. He added, I'm not here to cause trouble. Although he was lying, his heart was genuine. He didn't want to harm anyone. In a corner of the square, the village mayor whispered to a friend, it's better to keep him close. You never know with these types. The next morning, in a Fusha village inn, Satoru sat in a lotus position on the floor of his room, his thoughts taking him to an ethereal place. The white space was tranquil, filled with endless hallways full of compartments. Cautiously, he approached one of the hallways where rows of vials lined the shelves. Each vial shimmered with a different liquid, like encapsulated memories of sages. He picked one up, labeled Dr. Jero, inspecting the cautionary note about side effects. On all of them, there were warnings, some clear, others not so much, do not consume on a full stomach, may cause temporary coma, ensure you're in a safe place, unknown side effects. He sighed, that's why I haven't drunk any yet, he thought, recalling his escape from Logetown. He definitely needed a calm, safe environment. Hence, he chose Fusha Village. He continued walking within this inner space, and as he walked, his path grew brighter. Over time, he felt the atmosphere grow denser, loaded with energy and knowledge. Until he encountered another series of compartments, upon seeing one marked Master Rashi, his eyes lit up with excitement. This is exactly what I need. Next to it, a green compartment labeled Master Kami, Piccolo. Taking a deep breath, he grabbed both vials. Back at the inn, my Shiranui entered the room, noticing Satoru's meditative posture. With a concerned sigh, she sat beside him, her closed fan resting on her lap. Whatever you're planning, she murmured, I hope you know what you're doing. At night, Inside a room at the inn, Fusha Village. Windows closed, the soft flickering of a candle lighting the room. There, my Shiranui held a wet cloth, gently wiping the face of a silver-haired man, lying on the bed, breathing heavily. She remembered the previous moment. He had collapsed on the bed, tired, sweat dripping down his forehead. Panting, as if he had used up all his strength. My couldn't understand at all, but she felt the weight of the moment. Mai hesitated for a moment, gazing at him affectionately. Despite her recent existence, all she understood was that he was her reason for being. Without him, she wouldn't even exist. That feeling of connection, that unbreakable bond, was all she knew. With her face turning slightly red, she looked at his lips. There was a pull, a need. Slowly, she leaned in and drew closer, softly kissing his lips and her ample breasts, soft and warm, touched Satoru's body. Satoru stirred lightly. Mai looked at him with hope. 
perhaps? With graceful movements, she began to undo the knot of her attire. The red fabric slid over her fair skin, revealing the thin strap of her bra underneath. The shadows in the room accentuated her body's curves, as her skilled fingers manipulated each piece of clothing. Once completely naked, her delicate fingers touched her nipples, arousing her body. A mischievous and dewy expression crossed her face as she gazed at Satoru. She drew nearer, climbed onto the bed, and lay atop him. Satoru's breathing became uneven, his mind too was swirling, trying to grasp. He opened his eyes, and a mix of emotions, surprise, joy, confusion all merged, creating a storm inside his chest. In that brief span of time, he thought back to every moment up to that point, since he reincarnated. The execution of Roger, the hunger, the fights, and the escape. Suddenly, looking at Mai, he wanted to seize this moment, to freeze it in time. Slowly, he held Mai's face, aiming to deepen the kiss, becoming utterly lost in that moment. Their tongues intertwined, and the heat grew with every second. With much hesitation, they parted briefly, Mai's eyes shimmering in the dim light, her breathing as heavy as his. She smiled, a shy and genuine smile, conveying emotions deeper than words could express. And as their eyes met, he realized that, despite life's unpredictability, some moments are simply meant to be. He pulled her close once more, deepening the kiss again, becoming profoundly lost. The first rays of dawn gently illuminated Fuchsia village. Outside the window, early signs of village life commenced, with villagers preparing for another day's work. The soft light of dawn seeped through the room's window at the inn. Inside, a gentle breeze rustled the curtains, bringing with it the sounds of distant seagulls and birds. Crumpled sheets were visible, and a strong scent of sweat permeated the room. Lying in bed, Satoru slowly opened his blue eyes, feeling somewhat disoriented. Besides the heated events of the previous night, the memories of the vial still carried some uncomfortable side effects. He turned to see Mai's voluptuous, sweaty body beside him, a testament to the previous night's activities. He couldn't help but admire her with a lustful gaze. Her face, her ample bosom, and her hourglass figure reminded him of anime and game characters from his time. Even now, in deep sleep, she remained the epitome of passion and beauty. He started reminiscing about the previous night. Initially, he was cautious since it was her first time. However, as time passed, she became more audacious and alluring. Her requests and moans were simply irresistible. Master Rashi had also taught him several, peculiar techniques, especially handy for such occasions. This reminded him of one of Rashi's lessons, a true master is not one who possesses mere strength, but one who conquers a woman's heart, Rashi had said with a serious yet lecherous look. Her eager requests made him want to dominate and claim her, both body and soul, as his very own. She experienced continuous climaxes, hearts seemingly appearing in her eyes, and he didn't stop, exploring her in various positions and settings. Every suggestion he made, she initially blushed and resisted briefly, but in time, she began to enjoy and even asked for more. Fortunately, both of their initial endurance was commendable. This continued until a certain point in the night when my experienced multiple climaxes, evident in her glazed eyes, followed by collapsing on the bed. And then, something unexpected happened. A white light emanated from her abdomen, revealing a heart-shaped red mark. He felt a change within himself, an inescapable powerful bond. Master, she murmured in her sleep. Suddenly, a movement brought him back to reality. He looked over and saw Mai. Hi, Captain, she blinked, smiling with a mischievous, sleepy look. Hmm, you're awake. Are you feeling okay now? Humph, did you want to finish me off? Don't do that again, she said with a deadly look. He chuckled. If you hadn't asked for so much, it wouldn't have been an issue. He grinned teasingly. She blushed and gave a gentle punch. Humph, you're not getting off that easily. He pulled my closer, kissing her deeply, their tongues intertwining with passion. After a few minutes, they parted, looking into each other's eyes with passion. But she remembered something. 
What happened last night? she asked, recalling his fainting. He took a deep sigh. The aftereffects of the vials are more intense than I thought. Vials? My asked, curious. I'll explain later, he said. She nodded, curious, but accepting. What do we do now? Let's take a bath, then head downstairs for some coffee. After that, we can plot our next move, he suggested. She nodded, excited about the idea. But first, he said with a sly smile, perhaps we can enjoy a few more moments here, and then, in the shower. She blushed. The inn of Fuchsia Village had an old-world charm. Would aged by time, tables, and chairs that seemed to have many tales to tell. The simple yet cozy decor echoed the village's character. The cool morning breeze entered through the open windows, gently rustling the cotton curtains. The aroma of breakfast filled the air, a scent that drew in hungry residents and travelers. There they were, Satoru and Mai, seated across from each other, breakfast spread out on the table. Mai inspected her plate, picking up a small portion with her chopsticks. Her brown eyes sparkled in frustration. This is unseasoned, she exclaimed, causing some villagers to turn their heads. She looked around, her gaze searching for something to spice up her food. Satoru, still eating with a satisfied expression, raised an eyebrow. She muttered something unintelligible, taking a small vial from her bag. If the food here has no taste, I'll give it some, she declared, pouring a red liquid over her meal. The liquid released a smoke that made some villagers cough. An older villager approached, his expression curious. Young lady, what are you using? he asked, his gaze fixed on the vial. Just some seasoning, my replied with a teasing smile. Do you want to try it? Before the villager could answer, Satoru stepped in. Perhaps it's best not to. It's an acquired taste. The old man, now somewhat hesitant, nodded. Maybe another time, he said, smiling politely before returning to his table. Mai took a bite of the now-seasoned food, her eyes lighting up with pleasure. Ah, that's more like it, she exclaimed, a satisfied smile on her face. Satoru chuckled, shaking his head, and took a sip from his coffee cup. The buzz in the end grew as the villagers began to chat amongst themselves, some sneaking glances at the foreign couple. It was obvious that Mai and Satoru were a novelty in town. One of the villagers, a sturdy-looking man, approached, his face was stern. You're that bounty hunter, aren't you? What do you plan on doing here, in Fusha village? Satoru gave a confident smile. We're just passing through. No intention of causing any trouble. The man sized them up. Finally, he sighed, extending his hand. I'm Hiroshi. If you truly have no ill intentions, you're welcome here. Satoru took the handshake. I appreciate your understanding, Hiroshi. Some inquisitive gazes still lingered on them. The presence of the pirate ship was still a cause for concern for many. Do you think they still suspect us? Mai asked, feeling the weight of the stairs. Satoru smiled, taking a sip of his coffee, his eyes gleaming with amusement. Possibly, he said, but it's inevitable. Well, I've never been one to blend in, she said with a mischievous grin. He raised his cup in a toast. Mai smiled, clinking her cup against his. To life, love, and all the surprises that come with it. They both drank, their laughter filling the air, as the morning sun shone through the windows, promising a new day full of possibilities. That morning, after having their breakfast, Satoru and Mai were still seated in the inn's restaurant, unfolding a piece of parchment and skillfully sketching the outlines of an island. A map began to form under their nimble fingers, accompanied by some comments and plans, while Mai watched with curiosity, a plate of tropical fruits still untouched beside her. So, this is the Goa Kingdom, she inquired, pointing to the sketched area. He nodded, yes. It's nearby. I've heard that the nobles of this place collect devil fruits as if they were mere gemstones. If I want more power, we need to go there. Their conversation was interrupted by the murmurs of villagers. With a glance, he realized the need for discretion and quickly folded the map, 
thanking the waiter for the breakfast and paying with a few coins. Leaving the inn, they walked towards the forest. The vegetation was thick, but the sounds of birds and the gentle breeze brought a sense of tranquility. However, Satoru's mind was racing, recalling the teachings of Master Piccolo, he began to focus his energy, sensing every vibration and essence around him. My looked on, intrigued. What are you doing? A technique I learned from Master Piccolo. Purification of the soul, or at least an attempt. After a while, he smiled. His key, as he would name it in another universe, didn't operate here in the same manner, but he could sense the hockey. It was different, but analogous. I've achieved it, he whispered, I can purify souls and harness them for my devil fruit. Mai moved closer, wrapping her ARM around his waist. And that's a good thing, right? He nodded. Yes. If I can master this. We'll be unstoppable, Mai. They continued their journey, the sun now higher in the sky. The prospect of raiding the Goa kingdom and acquiring more devil fruits for his collection invigorated Satoru. And he was confident that, with might by his side and the newfound abilities he was uncovering, the world of One Piece would truly be his to explore. The golden light of the sun bathed the forest surrounding Fusha village, and the green leaves shimmered with the morning breeze. Next to a waterfall on a huge rock. Satoru sat in a lotus position, his starry eyes closed in contemplation. Before, Satoru began, slowly opening his eyes to meet Mai's gaze, I had planned to simply train. Just that. We'd stay hidden here, for a year, avoiding the Navy's pursuit. So, you've changed your mind? Mai, standing and adjusting her clothes, looked at him with curiosity. Satoru nodded. Yes. Thanks to the new knowledge I've acquired. He raised his hand and, for a brief moment, an invisible aura glowed around him, showcasing a shadow of the power he held within. Master Piccolo taught me mental techniques. I believe with them, I can fully awaken the six eyes. Six eyes? Mai inquired, her brown eyes locked onto his, filled with curiosity. Satoru chuckled sardonically. It's an inherent power. Allows me to see beyond the norm. I believe that with the six eyes awakened, I can passively use observation hockey to its fullest extent, without any special training. Oh, and I'll teach you about it later, Mai nodded, recalling something. And those powers? Blue, red, and purple? Are they part of this? She moved closer, placing a gentle hand on his shoulder, remembering the peculiar repelling ability Satoru used in Logetown. Comment. On the ship, he mentioned to her that it was part of his eye's capabilities. Satoru shook his head, his gaze becoming more intense. Not exactly. Blue, red, and purple are modes of my inherent ability limitless. I can repel, pull, or combine. But for that, I need to use Conqueror's Hockey, which complicates its usage. However, with these techniques, I can manipulate space. When he unleashed the ability in Logetown, she initially didn't understand. But after their escape, he had reflected deeply and understood he had instinctively used Conqueror's Hockey in the heat of the moment. That's why he struggled to frequently use the limitless abilities, as there was no specific training for it. He vowed that, after his death, he'd have a word with the entity that brought him here. Was this written in fine print in the contract? He sighed at the thought. At least he confirmed one thing, he could certainly use Conqueror's Hockey. Mai watched him, lost in thought, then sighed, feeling a minor headache. All of this sounds somewhat complicated to me. But I'll always be by your side, whatever the plan. Satoru smiled, appreciating Mai's loyalty, and then gazed back at the horizon. When I first came to this world, I only craved adventure, power, and freedom. But now, I want to make a change here. And for that, I need to be bolder, I can't remain in the shadows anymore. So, go a kingdom? Mai smiled, determination shining in her eyes. Satoru stood up, stretching. Go a kingdom it is. Let's hunt for more devil fruits. 
with them, I have new plans, we'll be invincible. But before that, it's time we recruit some new members. Upon a massive rock, near a waterfall, in the forest surrounding Fusha village, the sound of cascading water mingled with the rustling leaves stirred by the cool breeze. The morning wind ruffled the foliage as Satoru, with his deep expression, remained seated upon the vast stone. In front of him were three objects, a silver dagger with intricate design, an antique pocket watch adorned in gold details, and a magnifying glass with a diamond lens. With his pale, agile hand, Satoru picked up the dagger, letting it spin between his fingers. Amazing, he murmured, this dagger is an art masterpiece. Mai, observing from a distance, crossed her arms, her ample breasts swaying with emotion, her eyebrows slightly furrowed. Are these items genuinely valuable? Satoru lifted the watch, observing the delicate hands ticking. He remembered the moment he found the chest on the pirate ship they had plundered, the ship of the Black Harpoon Pirates. He had hoped to find gold inside the chest, but instead, he discovered these relics. He knew that while these items weren't the gold he had anticipated, they were worth tens of millions of berries. The protagonist smirked, his expression dripping with sarcasm. Yes, raw gold would have been nice, but sometimes value isn't just in the form of coins. Recalling the ship of the Black Harpoon Pirates, a wave of nostalgia hit him. The fierce battle, the pirates surprised expressions upon witnessing his skills, and the metallic sound of the chest opening. What do you intend to do with these items? Mai asked, with an inquisitive gaze. Satoru stood, his eyes shimmering with determination. I will transform them, he declared confidently, wanting to utilize valuable and memorable objects, his glasses being an example. Standing, Satoru spread his hands, gazing deeply at a small, glowing energy orb hovering between his fingers. He remembered the souls he had absorbed, those belonging to the Black Harpoon Pirates. The energy throbbed, restless, but due to the purification techniques he had learned, he could sense the energy was no longer as tainted. He believed he could achieve the same purification effect once he awakens his Akuma Nomi, but reaching this level would be tricky for now. Hence, the current technique was helpful. I succeeded, he whispered, feeling a surge of satisfaction. Now it's time to put my ability to use once again. He focused, summoning the power of the Henshin Henshin Nomi, with the orb's energy stretching and transforming. Soon, a bright white light shone fiercely, and three female figures emerged, slowly taking shape. Each had a distinct appearance and aura, but all appeared as vivid as any human. The first, in a blue dress with spikes on her wrists and well-defined thighs, had her dark hair tied in twin buns. It was unmistakably Chun-Li. The second, in a green combat suit with blonde braids, was Cami White. The last, dressed in a red business suit with sunglasses and combat gloves, was Crimson Viper. Chun-Li looking around in confusion. Cami, on the other hand, immediately assumed a combat stance, eyes sharp and ready to strike. Crimson Viper merely adjusted her glasses, scrutinizing Satoru with a calculating gaze. Flashing a teasing smile, Satoru said, Welcome, my warriors, I am Satoru Gojo, your creator. It's due to my unique power that you're here. Satoru replied, We're about to embark on a grand adventure, and I'm sure your assistance will be invaluable. Still in the forest, near Fusha village. The birdsong created a symphony, complementing the serenity of the moment. Amidst that natural beauty, three new female figures stood out, each exuding a unique aura. Chun-Li, the first among them, had muscular and well-defined legs. Her short, tight blue outfit highlighted her slender waist. The silver bracelets on her wrist shone. Her long black hair, tied in two bulky buns, was her trademark. Beside her, Cami White, with pale skin, had well-defined muscles. She wore a military green leotard, topped with a beret covering part of her braided blonde hair. Her gaze, serious and determined, signaled she was ready for any battle. Crimson Viper, the third, boasted a more mature aura. Her combat outfit was stylish, paired with a white shirt and tie. High-heeled boots and her long wavy red hair cascaded down to her waist. Her sunglasses hid mysterious eyes. 
The ensuing silence was broken by the whispering wind. The three warriors looked at Satoru with confusion and curiosity. My Shiranui, observing the situation from afar, stepped forward, her brown eyes shining with a mix of irritation and jealousy. Why are they all women, Satoru? she asked, her fingers pinching her belly tightly. It was convenient, my, and they're strong. Satoru laughed, albeit a bit nervously. Convenient? Really? She approached him, her index finger pointing at his chest. You've always been full of surprises. Mai shot him a sharp look, crossing her arms, her ample breasts swaying. Satoru sighed. I know, I know. But it's nothing personal. We need a strong crew, I'll explain later. That doesn't answer my question. She tilted her head, a sly smile forming on her lips. He sighed again. Reflecting on his ability, Satoru had several insights. He admits, his inclination to create women may be partly attributed to his own appearance resembling that of Satoru Gojo, whose handsome features seem to captivate them. It's no joke. Satoru Gojo is indeed a handsome man, and he couldn't deny. Mai later admitted that she initially helped him in Logue Town because she fell for him, a common occurrence in the anime universe. He deduced this from his interaction with Mai, who, fascinated by his blue eyes and striking features, obeyed him without hesitation at first sight. Even without memories from the Street Fighter universe, Mai still retained innate characteristics of her original self, such as an intrinsically passionate nature. This ability for quick submission certainly minimizes potential setbacks. Which pleased him greatly. Moreover, his tendency to create martial art 2D game characters was likely due to the Akuma no Mi restrictions, preventing the transmission of mystical skills from the characters' original universes, allowing only their pure physical abilities and attributes. And he refrained from bringing indomitably spirited characters to life, recognizing the inherent dangers. It must be understood that, even after his death, his creations would exist autonomously, having free will. Thus, by splitting his soul, to animate them, unlike creating a horcrux from Harry Potter, if he died, he would lose all consciousness of his existence, synonymous with death. And if he were to create a powerful entity that started feeling increasingly subservient and got angry, the decision to exterminate him might be imminent. This deeply frightened him. Unpredictability would be constant, even in benevolent characters like Hashirama or Goku. It's impossible to predict their perception of their own existence and subservience to a being much weaker than themselves. He contemplated an alternative, but it also failed. Initially, when thinking of my Shiranui, he meditated and envisioned her as a child, due to her vulnerability and the potential danger if she disobeyed or even attacked him. He couldn't decide the life stage at which his creations would manifest. He thought a child version would be more docile. However, the adult Mai appeared. Fortunately, she was captivated by his natural charm, saving his life. This situation reinforced his theory. Moreover, he worried that characters initially strong in spirit might, over time, resist complete submission, becoming permanent threats in one piece. This thought was mainly due to remembering the scene where Madara and Hashirama were no longer controlled by the second Hokage's imperfect resurrection technique. And, unlike this technique, his creation can be considered a perfect version. Which is a problem. You know, I've been trying to figure out, she began with a mischievous smile, what's your relation with our captain? My shot her a cold look. That's none of your business, she retorted tersely. Crimson chuckled softly. Oh, I can tell, he's my type of man. Mai's gaze turned deadly. Sea Viper laughed. Kami rolled her eyes, we have work to do, remember? Supplies and intel. Despite feeling an attraction to Satoru, she viewed him more as a leader than a potential partner, hence wishing to avoid such musings. As tensions mounted between the women, a gathering of villagers grew larger by the minute. They eyed the trio from a distance. Many tales and rumors began circulating once they recognized my Shiranui. Kami noticed the suspicious gathering, I'll be right back. Mai nodded, turning to see Crimson still gazing at her. 
What do you want? Crimson Viper leaned in closer, her entrancing eyes fixed on Mai. I was just wondering. She began in a seductive tone, how is he in bed? That's none of your business, my huffed in annoyance. Memories of intimate moments with Satoru came flooding back, causing her to blush. She looked back at Sea Viper, he's mine. Viper chuckled, oh, I don't mind sharing. Before Mike could retort, Kami returned, holding a wanted poster. Enough of this. We need to leave. What happened? Mai inquired, leaning in to see the poster. Recognizing the face, her expression shifted, and she snatched the poster. In her hand was a wanted poster, displaying a familiar face, Satoru Gojo. The moniker, Touch of Death, was emblazoned in bold letters below, and beneath that, a bounty of fifty-seven million berries. Wanted dead or alive? Hmm, doesn't this complicate things a bit? Sea Viper remarked, pondering the implications for the heist, as Satoru would now be easily recognized in Goa Kingdom City. Noting the increasing crowd, my signaled towards the harbor. Let's go. Approaching the dock, the sound of the sea grew louder. There lay the pirate ship they had acquired in Logue Town. Its mast rose majestically against the clear sky, sails fluttering gently in the breeze. Beside the ship, goblins fidgeted, awaiting commands. Prepare to set sail. Mai shouted, ascending the ship's plank. Kami and Crimson followed closely. The goblins, hearing the order, rushed towards the anchor. One, with a puzzled look, turned to Mai, awaiting further instructions. Raise the anchor, you fool! Without hesitation, the goblins began their work, pulling ropes and adjusting sails. One, the ship started moving, leaving the village and dock behind. The sun shone high in the sky, casting its golden light upon the gray terminal, a chaotic and noisy place. Tents and stalls filled the area, each offering goods and information, while a cloud of dust rose from the crowded streets. Chun Li entered the terminal with authority, dragging a line of tied up thugs behind her. Their faces displayed fresh bruises and scars. The woman's blue eyes swept the place, challenging anyone who dared to look her way. Across the street, hidden by the shadows of a tent, Satoru watched her. His starry eyes hidden behind his new sunglasses, he studied every move of Chun Li, a shadow of satisfaction playing on his lips. The thugs murmured among themselves, clearly bitter about being defeated by this woman. They had tried to enslave her, a decision they now regretted dearly. Pedestrians stopped to watch, whispers and gossip spreading quickly. Nearby guards, drawn by the commotion, approached with covetous looks. In front of the gate. Chun Li stopped abruptly, causing one of the thugs to trip and fall. She gave him a piercing look, immediately silencing any protest. A portly guard approached, his eyes crawling over Chun Li. Need some help, dear, he asked with a lecherous smile. Chun Li raised an eyebrow clearly displeased. I'm bringing these men to justice, she replied coldly. Please, help us. She attacked us, for no reason, one of the thugs shouted. The guard laughed, clearly not believing him. What did they do? Try to touch you? I can't blame them, he said, leering at Chun Li's body. They tried to enslave me, she explained, pushing the thugs forward. A guard looked at them, then at Chun Li commenting, one woman took all of you down? Pathetic. Take them inside. They'll be judged there, and you can collect your reward, another guard instructed, his demeanor somewhat more serious. Chun Li nodded, not quite understanding the mention of a reward, Satoru hadn't mentioned anything about it. But before she could leave, a portly nobleman, dressed in ornately decorated clothing and jewelry, appeared near the gate. Why are you clogging the street with this riffraff, he growled, motioning to the guards. Seeing the noble's reaction, the guards quickly released the thugs, cutting their ties. Get lost, one of them ordered, shoving them away. Chun Li was stunned. Hey, they're criminals, she exclaimed, but the guards were no longer listening. One of the thugs, upon being freed, approached her. You'll regret this, he whispered, his eyes filled with hatred. 
Chun Li looked at him, but before she could reply, he and the other thugs vanished into the crowds of the gray terminal. Chun Li looked around, witnessing the misery and injustice everywhere. What just happened? She felt lost, unsure of what to think or do next. Hey, you! You brought in those scoundrels, right? Interesting. Are you a bounty hunter? A beauty like you shouldn't be doing such dirty work, the portly noble ogled at her, especially at her strong, muscular thighs. Just one look made him lick his lips, imagining the things he could do with her. His special chamber had been unused for a while, and now he had a perfect reason to use it. I was just doing what's right, she replied with evident distaste, still somewhat bewildered by all that had happened. She decided to leave, but before she could, she was stopped. The portly noble laughed. You know, maybe you'd serve me better at my mansion, I can pay mountains of gold. I'm known to be very generous. All you need to do is become one of my concubines, he suggested, looking her up and down lasciviously. In the end, he offered his greasy hand, beckoning her closer. I'm not for sale, Chun Li stepped away from the noble, clearly irritated. He raised his thick eyebrows, and his pale face turned red. He rubbed the luxurious rings adorning his fat fingers, a gesture known by his closest servants and slaves as a sign of rising irritation. His narrowed eyes fixed on Chun Li. Do you know who I am, daring to refuse my offer? I'm the eldest son of the Duke of this realm. His voice, usually calm and measured, now had a sharp edge. Can't you see the generosity I'm offering you? I might forgive you for this indiscretion, but kneel now. Well, I'm a free warrior. My loyalty can't be bought or forced, Chun Li replied firmly, meeting the noble's gaze. The noble let out a loud, scoffing laugh, but his eyes betrayed his growing rage. Guards, he shouted, pointing at Chun Li, seize her. She'll learn that no one defies my power and goes unpunished. All the nearby guards drew their swords and firearms, ready to obey his command. The blazing sun cast a golden light upon the gate of the Goa kingdom, near the gray terminal. The air was thick with tension, and the streets were bustling. Chun Li, in her blue chi pao, stood out starkly against the dusty brown backdrop of the city. Determination etched her face, but a hint of worry flashed in her eyes. That insolent woman! How dare she refuse my largesse, roared the noble, the fat on his face quivering with rage. Quickly! Seize her, he commanded. Immediately, over a hundred armed guards lunged at Chun Li, shouting and pointing their weapons. She took a step back, swiftly assessing her options. Chun Li inhaled deeply and sprang into action. With astonishing speed, her muscular legs delivered a spinning kick, taking down several guards. She deftly dodged bullets, leaping and rolling between stalls and walls. As the chase persisted, the cannons on the walls fired, blocking many escape routes. Smoke and debris clouded the air, rendering visibility nearly zero. Adrenaline surged through her veins as she strove to evade capture. Residents of the Gray Terminal scattered in all directions, gripped by fear. Amidst the chaos, Chun Li seemed to dance, utilizing her agility. However, no matter how skilled she was, the overwhelming number of guards began to encircle her. She felt her breath waning, the situation growing increasingly desperate. At a critical juncture, when it seemed Chun Li would be captured, a formidable force struck the ground, generating a shockwave that sent guards and rubble flying. All eyes turned, astounded, to the origin of this impact. Five stone monsters, serpent like in length, emerged. Atop one of these newly formed onyx was Satoru, with his flowing silver hair and starry eyes. Satoru sang jubilantly, living out one of his childhood dreams. I want to be the very best. Like no one ever was. To catch them is my real test. To train them is my cause. Ooh ooh ooh. Both guards and Chun Li stared in disbelief. What's he singing? Shoot now, a guard shouted. Suddenly, guards on the walls aimed their cannons at him. Spotting their movements, Satoru readied himself. Like a blur, he darted among the guards, touching each. Their souls started to drain, 
and they collapsed, faces etched in terror. Seeing the tides turning in her favor, Chun-Li unleashed spinning blows to fend off the guards. With a fluid motion, and using the newly gathered energy, Satoru began morphing random objects into Taurus, creating a flood of bulls and Pidgeys charging against the guard ranks. From above, hundreds of Pidgeys dubbed down, targeting the cannons and knocking the guards off the walls. Suddenly, from one of the walls, a massive cannon fired, aimed straight at Chun-Li. The protagonist spotted the projectile and, in a split second, moved as a blur to intercept it. 1. The blast was deafening, leaving behind a smoky haze. As the smoke began to clear, onlookers were stunned to see Chun-Li and Satoru and Skaved, some distance away. Chun-Li! Come! Satoru called, then looked at the onyx, crushed them. Ooh! Thunderous noises resonated. The duo seized the brief distraction, the subsequent impacts and screams, and began to retreat from the battlefield, fleeing the walls of Goa. In a narrow, deserted alley, safe from guards and mayhem, Chun-Li and the protagonist caught their breath. Echoes of destruction lingered. The street, full of shadows cast by narrow homes, was faintly lit by meager sunlight filtering through damaged roofs. These nobles. I always believed they had honor, she murmured, her voice wavering slightly. Chun-Li, still somewhat shaken, looked at Satoru, her uneven breath, betraying her fatigue. Looking at him, teary-eyed, she confessed, you know, I was so bound to the idea of justice. But now I see how naive I was. Her fingers slightly trembled, and she hid them behind her back. We all have our beliefs. It's natural. I don't blame you for it. He reached out, perhaps attempting to comfort Chun-Li, but she halted him. She blushed slightly, a mix of embarrassment and newfound resolve. You, would you still accept me? she asked, her tone ambiguous, hinting at both a desire for reconciliation and something deeper. He grinned, that characteristic, sarcastic yet sincere smile she had come to decipher so well. Grasping her hand in his, he gazed deeply into her eyes. I'm glad to have you back, Chun-Li. They shared a moment, a poignant silence, as the world seemed to vanish around them. Chun-Li smiled back, genuinely relieved, and they embraced. At the dock's horizon, near the gray terminal, the waves lapped gently, echoing the rhythm of the east blue winds. The sun shone brightly, illuminating the serene sea, but the dock itself appeared sterile and grimy. Close to a moored vessel stood Satoru his star-patterned blue eyes hidden under blindfolds, his silver hair reflecting the daylight. Beside him was the striking figure of Chun-Li in her blue chi pao, her thigh muscles showcasing her combat prowess. On the approaching ship, three female figures stood out, Mai Shiranui with her seductive appearance, accentuated by her red outfit and confident stance. Crimson Viper, whose crimson hair swayed in the breeze, and the imposing posture of Kami White in her green leotard displaying her military background. The ship finally docked, and the three women disembarked, their gazes meeting Satoru and Chun-Li's. The three women disembarked, Mai's eyes met Chun-Li's. Chun-Li? She exclaimed, surprised. The captain and I settled our differences, she declared, waving to the newcomers. I'm back with the crew. Chun-Li is with us again. The past is the past, said Satoru. Now that everyone's here, let's get down to business. The sea breeze mingled with the fresh wood scent of the ship's deck. Gathered around an improvised table were Satoru, Mai Shiranui, Crimson Viper, and Kami White, he unfurled a map on the nearby table. I wish to invade the Goa Kingdom. The nobles' coffers are filled with Akuma no Miz, gold, maps, items, and jewels. And I want them all. With the exception of Chun Lin, everyone else already knew this. Chun Li frowned, I understand. The nobles there deserve a lesson. As the discussion unfolded, Kami White approached Satoru. Revealing his wanted poster. This surfaced in Fusha village. It seems someone has taken notice of your deeds. The poster displayed the familiar face of Satoru with a bounty of 57,000 berries below. He accepted the poster, examining it with a raised eyebrow and a smirk. Good thing they got my best angle, he joked, his
his voice laced with satisfaction. Crimson, leaning in, eyes twinkling, provocatively said, Indeed, Captain, you look irresistible in that picture. Their gazes met, a flirtatious tension in the air. My, witnessing the flirt, held back. Her usually calm and passionate expression now shaded with jealousy, the tension among the crew grew palpable. Satoru laughed, let's focus on what's important. We have a kingdom to plunder. I apologize, Captain, but I think we could wait for another moment to attack. It would be good to study the map's layout more and identify all possible escape routes. We can't get cornered, said Kami. I've told you this won't be necessary. There's a secret tunnel leading directly to the port. If all other routes are blocked and things get complicated, we could use it as an escape route, my Shiranui, bending over. The movement shook her voluminous breasts. How did you know about this? A surprised Satoru asked. Mai, with a mysterious smile, replied, I have my ways. She continued, and here, beyond the castle, are the locations of all these nobles' mansions. If there are gold, jewels, and Akuma's no miz, they are surely stored in secret safes in these places. That means we'll have to infiltrate silently. And before getting discovered, we should locate, retrieve whatever items are there, before the Goa army mobilizes, right? Crimson pondered, staring intently at the table's map. Satoru smirked, ah, don't worry about that. Let's see if they can handle what I have in mind. Saying this, he took a small set of dice on the table and, concentrating intensely, used his Akuma no Mi. He was brimming with energy from previous battles and had purified it for use. He threw the dice overboard, and the items began to transform, in a blink of an eye, for majestic pidgets, flying Pokémon, appeared. Oh, they are magnificent, said Crimson, approaching and touching a nearby Pidgeot. These will be our means of transportation for the invasion, he declared. We will invade from above, during the night. The element of surprise will be our advantage. My, you will be the main strategist for this mission, using your ninja skills to help us locate and notify where the treasures are, Satoru continued. And you, Crimson, your observation will be essential for everyone's coordination. You'll stay in the sky with this Den Den Musthai, helping us avoid guards and unwanted attention and Kami and Chun Lin will position themselves strategically to ensure we leave without any hitches, disarming and knocking out any civilian, noble, guard, or commander, based on Crimson's intel. So, the plan is to infiltrate by air, and everyone will carry out their tasks, but how will we transport the treasures after they're located? Kami asked. We'll transport them underground. Once my locates all the points and passes the coordinates, I'll make digging Pokemon that'll create a route outside, directly from the locations. That's a decent plan, Kami remarked, but we need to be prepared for contingencies. Yes. I'm slightly concerned about a vice admiral showing up, Satoru admitted, they are strong and don't underestimate pirates. Crimson Viper chimed in. Right. You mentioned they have a power called hockey, and we don't. So, if we encounter a vice admiral, we're in trouble. Kami agreed. We're at a disadvantage in that regard. You still can't use hockey, Captain? He sighed, gently tugging the blindfold covering his eyes. I haven't had the time yet. Once we're done with this, we'll lay low for a while and train. Kami looked to the sky, where the early signs of sunset colored the horizon. We need to get ready. Night will fall soon. Satoru looked at his crewmates, let's do this. Be ready in ten minutes. The crew nodded, moving to fulfill their duties. The decision was made. Mai, who stayed behind, raised an eyebrow. You were referring to Garp, the marine hero, right? I remember you mentioning he's not an ordinary vice-admiral and he originates from this sea. She paused, but you don't think he'd come for a 57,000 berries pirate, do you? I don't know, Satoru replied, smirking, he's unpredictable. A few minutes later, Kami and Crimson Viper joined them. All supplies are ready, Kami reported. Let's go, he said, smiling. The group headed to the lower deck, where Pidgeot and Fiero waited, majestic and ready to fly. 
The attack team mounted the Pokémon, and Satoru looked at his comrades, giving a nod. With that, they soared into the sky, fading against the backdrop of the setting sun, a shadow, descending onto the Goa kingdom. Night enveloped the kingdom of Goa, descending from the clouds, the luminous silhouettes loomed in the sky, for massive pigeons, carrying stealthy infiltrators. My Shiranui, clad in her red kimono, adjusted to the gentle sway of her pidget. Her sharp, focused gaze searched for entry points. She held a den den mushy, ready to communicate. Crimson Viper, on the other hand, was more concerned about the perimeter. Mounted on her pidget, rifle in hand, she scanned for lookouts or guards. Her crimson tresses fluttered in the night wind, while the silencer on her weapon promised clean work. In formation, Cammy White and Chun Li shared a determined look. Both were ready to swiftly descend and neutralize any ground threats. Their synergy was evident, almost palpable. On the last Pidgeot, Satoru surveyed the landscape. The sound of beating wings broke the silence, but the Pidgeots, trained for stealth, approached quietly. My signaled, pointing to an empty balcony on one of the mansions. It was the perfect entry point. As they neared, a guard in a tower raised his lantern. Without hesitation, Crimson Viper fired. A single silenced bullet, and the guard fell, his lantern going out with him. The four pigeons landed gently, hidden in the darkness. The infiltrators disembarked, ready to start the operation. After signaling one another, they split up. Minutes later, Mai, agile as a cat, snuck through the corridors. Her goal was simple. Find and locate the safes in the mansions of the kingdom's greatest nobles. Quiet footsteps and alert eyes, she noticed a nearly invisible wire ahead. Near the wall, a mechanism. She observed, gently touching the wire with her fan. A slight tremor, signaling it's connected to something. Slowly, Mai slid her fan under the wire, lifting it enough to pass without activating the mechanism. With controlled breathing, she moved on, but her attention never waned. Outside, Crimson Viper hovered with her Pidgeot, peering through a long-range scope. She spotted a guard with a crossbow, ready to shoot. Swiftly, she aimed her silenced rifle and pulled the trigger. The guard fell, neutralized, his arrow never loosed. Kami and Chun-Li, on a rooftop, spotted a beam of light, recognizing it as a motion sensor. Chun-Li, with the agility of a dancer, leaped over, avoiding the beam, while Kami disabled the device at its base, using her combat skills to silence a guard who nearly spotted them. Status? Leaning against a wall, Satoru whispered into the Den Den Mushi. The replies came quickly. Each reported their findings, disarm traps, and possible routes. With a nod, he drew several small items from his pocket transforming them into various digging Pokémon, ready for the next move. In another hallway, Mai encountered a tile pattern. Her intuition warned her. She tossed a small object, which, upon touching the wrong tile, triggered poison darts. Memorizing the safe path, she moved carefully and gracefully, overcoming yet another obstacle. Each team member felt the tension, but also the determination. They were prepared, trained, and ready. Each disarmed trap and each silenced guard brought them closer to their goal. In the encompassing darkness of the Goa mansions, silence was broken by whispers and stealthy movements. Inside a mansion, Mai swiftly dodged a guard. Using her fan, she quietly neutralized him, leaving him unconscious. She signaled on the Den Den Mushi, I'm close. Above, in the starry sky, Crimson Viper, balanced on her Pidgeot, pinpointed and aimed precisely at rooftop guards. The sound of silenced shots blended into the night breeze. Rooftops clear, she communicated via the Den Den Mushi. Kami and chun -Li, in the rooftop shadows, moved in sync. Using precise and silent techniques, they neutralized patrolling guards. Kami applied her military training, while chun -Li showcased her Chinese martial art. Streets secure, chun -Li whispered into the Den Den Mushi. Satoru, watching intently, noticed more trained commanders entering the scene. With a motion, he signaled, prepare yourselves. Elsewhere, guards patrolled. 
my, nimble and discreet, took down an unsuspecting guard and donned his uniform. Using her fan, she revealed a hidden safe behind a tapestry. Upon opening it, a golden glow shimmered. She quickly communicated via Den Den Mushi, found the first one. She then dispersed a strong perfume around the area. In the sky, on her pidgeot, Crimson Viper, rifle at the ready, watched guards conversing. One shot. The commander fell. Silence reigned. Via Den Den Mushi, she announced, Commander down. Proceed. Kami, in the street shadows, noticed a group of guards. In seconds, she and Chun Li surprised them, delivering precise and deadly blows. With the guards neutralized, they moved on to the next mansion. Perimeter clear, Chun Li murmured into the Den Den Mushi. Moments later, within the second mansion, Mike quickly located another safe. Inside, an unfamiliar devil fruit. Touching the fruit, she felt its power pulse. Second mansion cleared, she informed via the Den Den Mushi. Once again, she spread a strong perfume around the area. From a vantage point, Crimson Viper identified a castle entrance. She signaled to Mai. Entrance to the right, she instructed. Mai nodded an acknowledgement and headed in that direction. Minutes later, in the third mansion, after neutralizing more guards, Mai found another room full of treasures. Jewelry, gold, valuable artifacts. She began collecting, filling bags. Found it, Mai whispered. He moved to a separate room. Inside, another safe containing another devil fruit. Objective achieved. She dispersed more perfume throughout the room and its surroundings. Satoru, start. All right. From below, digging Pokemon emerged in all three scented locations within the mansions, assisting in collecting and transporting the treasures. The team, having met their objectives, prepared to depart the kingdom of Goa, richer in treasures and stronger than ever. Suddenly, a loud alarm blared throughout the kingdom. Mai exclaimed. The once silent night was now filled with the sound of clanging bells and guards rushing towards the mansions. Meanwhile, Satoru was inside the king's castle of Goa kingdom. He heard the alarm and knew he needed to act quickly. Within the castle of the kingdom of Goa, cold marble hallways stretch out in every direction. Golden chandeliers sparkle, displaying the kingdom's wealth. Armed guards vigilantly patrol every nook and cranny. The sound of heavy boots echoes. Commanders organize defenses, giving out shrill orders. However, a figure, Satoru, moves forward fearlessly, his steps are light and nearly inaudible. With a faint smile, he raises an ancient coin. With the Henshin Henshin Nomi, he turns it into a Meowth. Help me locate the king, he orders. Meowth, sniffing and listening, moves swiftly, guiding Satoru. At every turn, a guard or commander presents himself, ready to halt the advance. Satoru, with skill, dodges, neutralizes, or simply overlooks, pressing forward. Satoru, moving with precision, progresses through the main hallway. The palace's lavish decor reveals a path, a giant door adorned with jewels. He knows the king is there. As they approach, the number of guards surrounding them increases. A solid barrier of soldiers blocks the path. Satoru looks at them mockingly, is that all? Attack now. The commander orders, pointing directly at Satoru. Confidently, Satoru creates from a small stone, a sand shrew, ready to attack. The Pokemon lunges forward, knocking down guards, creating an opening. A guard attacks Satoru from behind, but is quickly repelled by Satoru's strike. Suddenly, an arrow flies towards him. Satoru dodges, noticing the archers lurking in the shadows. His mocking gaze meets the commander's, who challenges him. The commander shouts, You shall not pass. 1. With a gesture, Satoru turns a nearby vase into a spiral. The Pokémon takes flight, distracting the archers and allowing Satoru to proceed. He swiftly moves his hands, turning two nearby ornaments into two muscular machamps. They rush forward, knocking down guards and clearing the way. Entering the throne room, Satoru faces the king, who sits majestically, surrounded by his counselors and elite guards. 
The king, dressed in crimson robes, stares at Satoru with defiant eyes. Satoru smiles, Good evening, your majesty, who are you to dare enter my castle and challenge my kingdom? The king asks, his voice echoing in the hall. Satoru replies with a sarcastic smile, Just a visitor interested in your treasures, majesty. His remark causes the guards to draw their weapons. One of the commanders, a sturdy man with a scar on his face, steps forward, roaring. You'll pay dearly for your insolence. Charging towards Satoru. Quickly, Satoru turns a nearby vase into another sandshrew. The Pokemon, immediately recognizing its master, lunges at the commander, distracting him and causing him to stumble. I expected more from the king's commander, Satoru mocks, while skillfully dodging subsequent attacks from other guards. Each of his movements is a martial arts dance, every strike accurate. Satoru, always one step ahead, turns other items around into Pokemon a Meowth from a tapestry, a Rattata from a sculpture. The Pokemon assault the guards, causing chaos in the hall. However, the sheer number of guards begins to pressure Satoru. He is forced to retreat, but not without first creating more Pokemon to defend him and assault the foes. With an opening, Satoru glimpses the king again. And with a nimble move, he lunges at the king, putting a dagger to his throat and holding him hostage. Everyone step back, or your king won't see the light of day again, Satoru taunts, lightly pressing a dagger against the king's neck. The commanders hesitate, but fear in their eyes is evident. As the commanders back off, shocked by Satoru's audacity, you wouldn't want anything to happen to your beloved king. Would you? A glint of determination appears in his eyes. The king's guards, taken aback and hesitant, assess the situation. The commander, with a determined expression, advances, release our king, pirate. Satoru smirks mockingly. He's my shield now. But don't worry, I'll return him after I finish my business here. As he proceeds down the corridor, using the king as a shield, Satoru calculates his escape route. The king, although clearly fearful, murmurs, you won't get out of here alive, thief. We'll see, Satoru just laughs, his mocking smile standing out in the castle's dimness, determined to leave with his treasures and his life. His footsteps echo down the hallways. Guards, equipped with swords and spears, emerge from every corner, trying to prevent the intruder's escape. But he turns random items around him into Pokemon Rattatas and Ekans, which jump on the guards, delaying them. Plus, of course, threatening them with the king's death. With the help of the king, he identifies the treasure room. If you want to live, king, I suggest you cooperate, says Satoru, as he forces him to open a massive safe in the treasure room. The gleam of jewels, gold, and Akuma no miss captivates all. What a nice collection you have. It would be a shame if someone stole it, Satoru smiled. With the aid of digging Pokemon, Satoru quickly gathers over 700 million Brazilian reals in gold, seven Akumas no Miz, countless ancient books and encyclopedias, and thousands of regional maps from various parts of the world. The king, in a desperate move, tries to grab an Akuma no Mi to eat. However, Satoru prevents this, knocking him out. Perhaps you should pick your battles more wisely, your majesty, he remarked. With the treasures in hand and the king slung over his shoulder, Satoru heads for the exit. At the castle entrance, he mounts a giant Pidgeot, preparing to flee. With one last look at the castle, Satoru smirks. He throws the king, releasing him after a few meters. Satoru warned, you can keep your king. But remember. This was the day the great Satoru G. The sound of cannons boomed suddenly. One comment. He narrows his eyes. Never mind. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe.